Uh, our first uh, panelist will be Christiana Almeida from American Red Cross. But prior to Christiana's presentation, David Alexander from the Department of Homeland Security's Geospatial Management Office will uh, provide some background and context for the federal perspective on social media and GIS. Um, David, you're on. All right, thank you, Peter, and thanks everyone for attending today's webinar. Just wanted to make a few opening remarks before the panelists proceed with their discussions. Um, first and foremost, uh, I think one of the things that we've identified at the federal level is that you know social media and open source data definitely provides a, a new and best opportunity to transform our approach to shared situational awareness. It also provides more opportunity to further engagement with the citizens and make uh, situational awareness a collective activity across the whole of community. However, with that, we have several, you know, besides the immediate benefits, there are several challenges and concerns. You know, while social media provides us uh, access to more immediate and more frequent information, uh, it does help to drive more democratization and participation across some of our key areas of operations. And it can reduce the degrees of separation between those who we're serving versus those that are providing the service uh, there, and makes us more anticipatory based. Uh, there are some challenges around privacy concerns. How do we drive uh, that information to the right point of, of, of entry? And then how do we search and mine the new volumes of information that would be generated by those interactions? Uh, while GIS may help us to better visualize and drive context towards the scenarios that we're engaging in, uh, we still have to address how we formulate those linkages between the information inflow and the operations that will provide the service and outflow. Uh, that being said, there have been some success stories at the federal level particularly involving Homeland Security. Uh, DHS has, has, has been successful in rolling out the See Something, Say Something initiative for suspicious activities reporting and, and threat reporting with citizen engagement. Uh, USGS through DOI has been successful in deploying out the Did You Feel It application to field information for the citizens around earthquake hazards. Uh, I think those are some very good tests case real-world examples of how social media and the citizens can contribute to more efficiencies in response and recovery services around homeland security from a larger spectrum. Uh, and I, I think we're curious to learn more from our partners as well as from not just at the federal level but also the state and local level on what they're doing and how they're embracing the challenges and providing more value to the citizens and their missions. Uh, that being said, I'll, I'll turn it back over to uh, Peter and the other panelists. Hey, Dennis. Thank you, David. Um, next up is our first panelist, Christiana Almeida from uh, the American Red Cross. Uh, Christiana, I think you should have the um, presentation uh, privileges now. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you um, and how American Red Cross utilizes geospatial technologies um, uh, to get out to the community. Great. Well, thank you so much um, for the invitation to present today. It's definitely uh, a good topic to be here for. And as I'm pulling up my presentation right now, um, just a little bit of background about myself. Again, my name is Christiana Almeida. I'm with the American Red Cross. Um, I'm on the social engagement team at National Headquarters. And so just to give you a, a quick overview of what I'm going to be sharing today, I'm going to be sharing a lot about how we have evolved our digital disaster response, um, especially within the past uh, two years, and kind of where we plan on going from here. So who we are, we're actually a two-woman team um, at National Headquarters. We you know, drive strategy on the, notion, on the national level we also support all of our chapters and our life of business. Um, but in addition to kind of the strategy, you know, backstory stuff, we really do work on interacting and creating content for our online communities every day 
And we also read and respond to thousands of posts every single day. So on a day-to-day -day level, you know, like a day-to-day, -day, it is beautiful, it's sunny, the things are relatively calm. There are roughly three to 6,000 mentions of the American Red Cross on a day like today. If we're looking at a large-scale disaster, such as a Hurricane Sandy, we are looking at over 100,000 mentions of the Red Cross in a given day. So knowing that we were having to scale up and scale down on a regular basis, we had actually started devising a plan on how we can do that. Um, and so this actually kind of, so we had set out these goals that kind of drive our day-to-day -day strategy that help us scale up and scale down to help the communities that we serve in an emergency. Maybe after my webinar. So first and foremost, we want to carry out the organization's mission online. So we want to help people prevent, prepare for, and respond to emergencies day to day so that when we're in the uh, respond to emergency phase, we are able to easier activate our online communities. Uh, next, we always want to grow our network of passionate supporters. We're certainly not concerned about having the largest number of followers on Facebook or Twitter, but we are concerned about having engaged users on platforms. We would much rather have 5,000 people following you know, our uh, program online that will interact with us, that will retweet us, that will comment on things that we have, than 5 million people who don't interact with any of the content that we have. Uh, lastly, and this really pertains uh, to this conversation, our goal is to give the public a seat at our operational decision-making table. So this is where um, our digital disaster operation comes into play. This is where our digital volunteer program comes into play. Because at the end of the day, there are people in the communities that we're serving, um, especially during disaster relief operations, that are talking about their experience. So whether they haven't seen um, any assistance coming to their area or whether they are seeing an emergency response vehicle driving down their street handing out meals, we want to make sure that what they're saying comes to our table because that's going to help us serve them in the best way possible. So social media over the past couple of years has definitely become a very kind of integrated part of our disaster response. Our social program was initially created to kind of make quote, all the bad bloggers go away. So we really kind of saw it as a, uh, not necessarily a fight, but there are people out there talking about the Red Cross and they're saying negative things. And so that's how our social program started, was to start engaging those people who may have been saying bad things. And we've recently started a shift in, in what the kind of, some of the goals of the social program that I had just shared with you, um, so that we're now going from this kind of person-to-person -person or kind of reactive cleanup to a much more proactive um, outreach and response effort so that, again, we're not just responding to something after it happens, but we're able to listen to the conversations on the ground to help us make, you know, more informed decisions because that's going to help us reduce costs. It's going to help us be more, you know, efficient with our materials and our resources and the human uh, power that we have on the ground as well. Um, so the three main things that we have found that people utilize social for during an emergency is they're trying to learn more about the disaster, whether they are going to be impacted or whether they care about people that are going to be impacted, usually family members. Um, second, they're asking for help. These are people who might be in communities that have yet to be served. Um, or third, they're sharing information about what their own well-being with family and friends. You know, we especially see this when we have disasters where um, power goes out. People are able to say, hey, you know, we're in, our, we're in our closet or we're in the basement, but we're okay hanging, hanging in there. And so in order to kind of better serve the public, we do have a, a suite of tools that we use. Um, one of them is our digital command center, which is also known as our DigiDoc. Um, this is kind of, this is physically hosted within our larger disaster operations center um, so that anyone within the operations center can come by and get an easy visual as to kind of what the conversation on the ground is, what the volume of the conversation is uh, regarding certain topics. Um, and then we can even dig deeper into that with the Insights dashboard. Um, so this is just information as to uh, volume of conversation, change in volume of conversation, uh, word clouds, which you know we've all used on a uh, pretty semi-regular basis to kind of give a, again, a 30,000 foot level of what the conversation is. 
Um, and then this is all actually driven by our engagement console. So the engagement console is driven by uh, a Radian 6 software, which is a Salesforce uh, tool. And it gives us the opportunity to engage our volunteers to be working within this engagement console so that they are the ones um, tagging things and feeding the Insights dashboard, which in turn feeds the Digital Command Center. So we definitely would not be able to have a robust um, visual story of what's happening on the ground in the Digital Command Center without the number of volunteers that we have working in the engagement console. So just this is just kind of a, a rough picture of uh, what the Digital Operations Center looks like. So, you know, in, in the top corner there, you, this, that's actually what we call our heat map. Um, so that actually gives us a good idea of the volume of conversation that's happening, you know, in certain states. Uh, when we first launched the Digital uh, Command Center, we actually had um, tornadoes touching down literally the day after we fired this thing on for the first time. And we were sitting in this op sitting in this room, and all of a sudden, like, we just saw the state light up red. And so we go into the state, figure out what the conversation is, and we were able to determine that a school, a high school, had been hit by a tornado. And we happened to have a team on the ground at the time, and so we just said, hey, go check this out, see to see what kind of resources are going to be needed in this area based on what we think we're hearing. So within, you know, 20 or 30 minutes of it being safe for people to go out, we were able, we had a team on the ground, they gave us an assessment, and we were able to get resources out there as, as soon as possible. And we had a better idea of what resources were needed within that area as well, which is always really helpful. So, again, the, the foundation of this program is really based on strong digital volunteers, or as we call them, digivols. Um, they help us carry out our you know, humanitarian mission online. They provide timely information to those in need, and they offer emotional support. So when we know that there is a storm coming, so whether it is you know, high risk of tornadoes in one area or a hurricane coming in, we have digital volunteers in that engagement console ahead of the storm listening to people that may have, you know, emotional support. They're saying that they're scared. They're not sure what to do. Um, so our digital volunteers will actually reach out to those people who may not even be mentioning the Red Cross at that time. Um, so reach out to those people. Let them know that someone's listening, what we call a digital hug. So let them know that someone's listening, someone cares, someone, someone's going to hope that they're going to be okay, even if they're alone in their house at that time but also provide them a piece of very actionable, um, an action item that they can do in that moment. So, for instance, if there's a tornado coming in, an action item that we can give that person is to grab their radio, flashlight, and cell phone and to head into their basement or to head into, like, an innermost windowless room. So we train these volunteers to um, have some knowledge of the Red Cross, but to also kind of give them that human touch. Um, <laughs> And we've actually been looking for a lot of digital volunteers that are outside of our Red Cross circle because they have a better idea sometimes of what's going on on the ground than we do. So just so you know, we're looking very much to try to go outside our own circle for digital volunteers. Um, another thing that our digital volunteers do is they find trends and conversations that can help us make better and faster operational decisions. So a very recent example of this happened during the uh, Oklahoma tornadoes. So we, we had people on the ground, we had responses in, you know, obviously more Oklahoma was a very hard hit area, but we started seeing trends that the Pecan Valley area was also a hit and they were in need of services. They had to cut power for a few days, there were some buildings destroyed. So we were able to, again, kind of take this online that the operation didn't know about. The, the physical operation on the ground had no idea <laughs> that, that this area was in need. And we were able to grab this information from online, feed it to the on the operation on the ground, and they were able to get services out there the next day. So it's, it, it allows us to make to, to get this information faster than we may have before. Um, and lastly, you know, give the public a seat at our operational decision-making table. And this can go in a variety of directions. Pardon? Uh, hi, Peter. I'm going to um, just stop you for one second. Um, yeah. Someone somehow managed to get... Um, uh, unmuted, and we were hearing some background noise a little bit. I'm not sure if it's distracting you, but you're doing great. I'm just going to mute everybody, and then I'll unmute you, okay? Okay, great.
Okay. Are you good? I am. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. I, Perfect. Someone um, was able to get around uh, able to get around WebEx is muting somehow. Okay. <laughs> thank you. You're on. And lastly, we want to give uh, the public a seat at our operational decision-making table. So again, if we are seeing large clusters of people saying that help is needed in XYZ areas, we're going to feed that to the operation and help them. But this also can be a much more human interaction as well. We were receiving some feedback during one of our uh, disaster responses of a couple people staying in the same shelter that we had a shelter manager that was not necessarily acting in accordance with the standards that we would want a shelter manager to act. So we received, we did receive feedback from at least three different uh, sources online. We were able to contact, um, again, the on-the-ground operation, and we had that volunteer removed within 24 hours. So we don't just want to be able to send resources somewhere, but those people that we are serving, we want to be serving them in the you know highest quality possible. And so if that means removing a volunteer from the ground, if people are talking about it, we need to be listening to that. Because um, I always like to think at the end of the day that we are providing a service to people, and we want them you know in their darkest hour, in their most emotional time, they need to be provided the best service possible. So if we're receiving feedback that we're not able to provide that level of service, we need to do what we can to fix that. And so as we train our digital volunteers, they do actually have a very integrated role into our larger disaster relief operation. Um, and this is kind of a, a quick overview as to how that happens. You, you see the dotted lines is kind of our, our disaster operations center that will sit in D.C. or you know, on the ground. So our disaster services, my engagement team, um, our disaster relief operation, and then the local chapter, um, whether it's their disaster relief operation as well as their communications team as well. So our digital volunteers work on integrating with the public or working with the public to get them information to hear what they're saying, but and then they feed it to us, and then we're feeding that to the entire operation, whether it's in D.C. or on the ground. And then the operation from the ground in D.C. as well as on the ground, regardless of where the disaster is, they're able to take that information and feed it back to the public. So we actually um, pull together reports based on this social information that we're getting, and we send it to the disaster relief operation every single day. So we are uh, creating, we are basically inserting social into the operational DNA of a disaster relief organization. And this just gives you kind of a, a visual of the Insights dashboard that I had mentioned earlier. So this is the information that my team is looking at. So once we get, um, once our digital volunteers have been working within the engagement console, it feeds this, this dashboard here for us. Um, so you can kind of see that we have broken out our listening into a couple things. If you look at um, the very center uh, vertical type screen there where it says copy of hurricane season 2012, you see that people are talking about damage reports, emotional support, shelter, emergency assistance, and Red Cross mentions is actually much further down the list, but we are listening to all of these conversations even if they're not talking about the Red Cross because even if someone's not talking about the Red Cross, they're, if they're in an affected disaster zone, they are talking about the disaster and that can give us information, um, again, to feed the operation. And so we even have um, we have it broken down into a pie chart. We also have uh, a sentiment chart. And on the top uh, right corner there, you can see just kind of how these volume trends have changed over a couple day period. And we actually see um, it's given us a better idea of not only what, when we need to be providing services when. Um, so maybe we are changing uh, disaster relief operations to be slightly more proactive based on maybe trends that we are seeing in past disaster relief operations. Um, but it also helps us determine when's a good time to make a financial ask and when's obviously a very inappropriate time to make that ask. So it's also helped our fundraising team too to be a little more um, a little more in tune with what's happening on the ground. And so these are just a couple of um, examples that we have received when we first launched the digital disaster operation. So we do have people that are giving us very specific locations that are in need of assistance. We have people that are looking for loved ones. Um, and we have people who e either know someone on the ground that is affected that is speaking on their behalf. 
So this is something that we will often see is someone who's not specifically in the disaster affected area, but if they're online too much or watching the news too much, they're seeing things as well and they're going to make us, you know, aware of those things regardless sometimes whether or not those are, um, that they're true. So that's another thing that we have to deal with is how to manage information to determine whether it's an actual need or whether it's kind of outside um, or whether it's an outlier piece of information that may not be relevant to us or may actually not need to be a piece of information that uh, requires action at that time. And so uh, jumping forward a little over two years, this was um, our most recent large-scale response was the Oklahoma tornado. Um, and this was actually, so if we look at the example on the left side of the screen, we actually had received a couple of, um, a couple of messages, not necessarily from Facebook, but also from Twitter, saying that these little areas were, were not uh, receiving Red Cross services. So within the first day or two of seeing these, we were able to kind of take that information, put it to the operational table, and get supplies and get manpower into that area. And then once we continued to see these evolve, we actually had the capacity or the ability to say, hey, we actually heard this a couple of days ago, and since then we've had three or, you know, emergency response vehicles driving through the areas. We have a shelter set up in one of those areas, and we have, you know, we have supplies on the ground. So it gives us the opportunity to, to do that follow-up as well. Um, and then huh, on the right side is what we have is when we start dealing with uh, rumor management. As with any disaster, there are always going to be rumors. Two that we had to deal with that were very major for the Oklahoma tornado was um, somebody thought that the Red Cross was charging for water. And the second one was that someone had posted that the Red Cross was leaving town 10 days after the, after the first tornado touched down, which was, of course, right around the time the second tornado was, a uh, string of tornadoes was coming in. So it was, it's hard because these are the posts that have a tendency to ignite across the social sphere a lot faster. However, having volunteers that are taking regular shifts and monitoring pages on a regular basis really helps us to squash these a lot faster. So even though we had a high volume of some of these coming in, we were able to respond to people on a more individualized basis. And so on this one here, you can see that uh, our volunteer, Christoph, was a volunteer who had taken care of this person immediately, and we had followed up because this post had just started, had pretty much just started taking a life of its own. So, you know, I'm sure any any organization who has dealt with a disaster has had to deal with the rumors of a disaster, and so this has really helped us kind of squash some of, the, some of them a little bit. And then just kind of our overall results of this, since we fired up the Digital Disaster Operations Center and had our first couple of um, disasters run through it, leadership has had a huge interest in it, and basically the, the information that we are receiving through the social web has become an integrated part of the data reporting during a disaster. So those, those reports that we create for our disaster leadership every single day become a very major part of the operation and the decision-making process. Uh, next, we have uh, training developed for Red Cross employees and volunteers who wish to participate um, in this kind of a role as a digital volunteer. Um, and just so you know, if this is something that you're interested in, we do offer this training at least once a month. It's called Social Basics. And then we have a more advanced training for our digital volunteers. If this is something you might be interested in at least looking at or checking out, uh, to read up more on it, you can go to just Google the term Red Cross University, and that will take you to the main page to give you more information on being a digital volunteer and what the program does. Um, as of now, you know, since we launched this about a year and a half ago, we have trained more than 100 digital volunteers. And so these are people that, you know, when we do have a disaster that we, we do a sign up, we do the call out for, we do the sign up for, people are taking four hour shifts, they're doing their reports, they're interacting with one another. And so it allows us, the social engagement team, to really focus on getting that information to the disaster leadership on the ground. Um, again, this has led to faster response times because we've had better on the ground information. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we do still occasionally get some of those outlier pieces of information. If someone says, hey, I'm in Birmingham, Alabama, and I need a sandwich, 
that's not necessarily going to cause us to get an emergency response vehicle driving down the road to that person. But if we're seeing 20 people saying, hey, you know, we need a sandwich, okay, that's going to help us make a decision to do that. Um, also, you know, greater situational awareness. This is also information that we not just hold with ourselves, but we do share with some of our uh, disaster relief partners as well. I know that we've worked with FEMA, Humane Societies, you know, and others to help them get a sense as to what we're hearing that might help them as they're moving forward through the disaster response and relief process as well. Um, and lastly, you know, this has definitely been a learning process for us. We have we've determined that, you know, deploying our digital volunteers needs to be treated just like deploying a physical, a volunteer physically to the ground, that they, that they do need, you know, the follow-up that we offer for all of our, um, all of our volunteers, that they do um, interact with our disaster mental health people on a regular basis, and we offer all those resources to them. And so the digital um, deployments are now being treated like a physical deployment in terms of, you know, you get credit for hours served, you get the same resources available to anyone on the ground. So we are evol continually evolving this program as we're moving forward. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Christian. That's great um, information on the uh, digital volunteer effort. Um, I'm passing it over to Ryan Langclose now, and I'll be unmuting him. If there are any questions for Christiana, and in uh, particular about how she, uh, the American Red Cross is deploying that capability, but also how the American Red Cross, um, you might help participate in that activity um, and become a digital volunteer, um, we can address that later on, obviously, um, in the call or we can um, hook you up directly with Christiana if that helps. Uh, Ryan, we should be seeing your address, um, your desktop, um, which I now do. Uh, Ryan Lenclose from uh, Esri will be running through some case studies that uh, Esri has participated in, um, in the use of GIS and social media, and then he'll get into how you can create an app um, uh, and, and really get your hands dirty a little bit. So Ryan, um, you're on if we can get you going. Perfect. All right. Thanks, Peter, and, and thanks, Christiana, for that. Yeah, I really appreciated your your vision, kind of the strategy that American Red Cross has for digital volunteers and the value it provides the organization, and some really good examples of why we should be thinking about this. So, I, I think it's a great setup. You know, my my role here, Esri, is to manage our emergency management industry, and one of the programs that that encompasses is the Esri Disaster Response Program. Um, it's something that we do here at Esri as part of our corporate citizenship. There's no cost for anyone globally to call us and ask for assistance and, and help with geospatial technologies to, to provide support for a response. And we've learned a lot doing that. Um, you know, so I wanted to take that perspective today a little bit on, on some of the lessons that we've seen around you know, enabling digital volunteers or the citizens in our communities to bring their own voice to the table, as Christiana mentioned, um, and how we can start to build really simple and effective applications that allow them to start telling us really focused things so the idea of crowdsourcing and moving it into the, the conversation for situational awareness, as David set us up for. And I wanted to, to take a step back to the end of, of last year and look at Hurricane Sandy, because there were really two good examples of crowdsourcing and using geospatial technologies, GIS, to really enable that process to occur. And so I wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit, as Peter said, around a couple of case studies and examples to show you what some of those applications look like, and then to give you some some tangible steps that you can do now, kind of a three-step process to be up and running and, and leveraging GIS technologies to start engaging those digital volunteers and communicating with them for your situation awareness. So let me start with Hurricane Sandy and crowdsourcing. So there's two good examples. One was actually a presentation that was just done a couple weeks ago by Michael Naughton at the city of Huntington um, on Long Island in New York. And this is a really good example because it's a smaller community and Michael said, you know, we had had problems when we had Hurricane Irene with the, the citizens and engaging them in the process of debris removal. And uh, so when I took the screenshots from, from the website, it was around November 29th, uh, Hurricane Sandy had already come through, the, the debris was down, and they were in the middle of this process of cleaning up. And this is what we're seeing on the screen. And there's two things that I want to point out. So one is the use of GIS to start collecting information around uh, debris and engaging the citizens to tell them not only where the debris was being sited, but what debris they're seeing. Is it a simple tree down that's blocking the road? Is there a power line down as well? So a very focused application to allow citizens to communicate back what they're experiencing, what they're seeing, 
and how the city can start to effectively engage them in the process of cleanup. And I thought they did a, a second thing really well, and that's the bottom right-hand side. So it's the idea that GIS is not just about enabling folks to give their voice out, but it's also allowing us to get a better perspective, a better handle on the operation itself, and the ability to communicate back out, as Christiana describes, it's a two-way street with communication with our, with our volunteers and the citizens. So the right-hand screen is actually some interesting metrics they had. And on the 29th, when I copy this, I'll just kind of give some, some quick quotes because I think it's interesting. So Michael and the team said with Hurricane Irene that had come through previously, they had about three weeks of cleanup. They had about 70,000 cubic yards of debris, and that brought down about 1,100 trees. And on the 29th, they said, you know, Hurricane Sandy actually brought down 2,500 trees. You're helping us report that. And to date, we've cleaned up about 182,000 cubic yards. We're about 49% complete on our first pass. And you can see with the map exactly what we're doing in the community and how many times we made a pass compared to what you're telling us there uh, with debris in your yards and on your streets. So they've two things. They've collected information from the citizens and the digital volunteers. They've used that to drive their operations and situation awareness, and they're engaging them in the process as well, telling the metrics along the way. So some interesting things that I'll share with you. There's a couple of links in here that we'll share afterwards, and I, I wanted to provide these to you as a starting point. And this is specifically from Hurricane Sandy, some data collection applications, tools, maps, and apps that you can start with uh, that were used. So you'll notice there's a drown, down tree survey. There's damage assessment uh, process underway and gas station. And I'll mention a couple of these in more detail, but this link that's in this slide here will actually take you to real applications that were in use specifically as the one we just described from, from Michael and his team. So when you get the resources later and we share these slides, you'll be able to, to access some of these details. The second one that I wanted to come back to was a, another interesting tag. So this was not necessarily focused on one community, but more broadly around a geography where the, the idea of gas shortage was really starting to take hold during Hurricane Sandy. And the state of Rhode Island reached out and said, you know, we'd like a way to engage the community, right, broadly the community across the state of Rhode Island to, to tell us whether they're seeing both damage, but also where gas shortage are being reported. Um, do they have spills on the ground? Is there electrical outages? So we're getting a whole lot of information collected from the citizens in the crowd using GS technology. But I wanted to point this out because it was a another unique requirement. What they ask is that it doesn't have to be a native application that somebody has to go discover in an app store and download and put on their phone right in the middle of an event, right? When people don't have time to go and discover that application, download it, set it up and be off and running. The requirement is that they wanted this to be browser-based. It has to be able to just be sent out through social media, through the, the news channels that are out there, and be able to touch a URL, spin up a, a responsive website, meaning that responsive that it works on a, on a browser on a computer, it works on a phone, it works on a tablet, regardless of what browser it is, to be able to then start collecting that information. And so the screenshots you see here are what that prototype application was, was built to do. So the first part is in a report. And they're telling you right up front, you know, we're not actually looking for uh, reports from you on um, need in, in terms of detail. If you have an emergency, you should still call 911. This is an opportunity for you to help us engage in this process, to have your voice heard in our response. If you could agree, go on to the next page. The next part is tell us where you're at, either by your address or use the GPS on your phone, or simply tap the map if you're, you know where you are. Maybe you had visited a site earlier that didn't have gas and you wanted to go back and report it. Then the third screen popped up, and it was the simple attributes. And these are yes, no radio buttons, right? Was there damage to where uh, you are or where you were? Did you see debris blopping the road? Were there down power lines? Was there fuel spilled? On and on. So they set up a data model. They determined exactly what they wanted the community to tell them about. And that's what we're seeing here enabled in that third slide, which leads to the last part, which is thank you for telling us this information. And if you'd like us to follow up with you, you can enter your name and phone number and address upload a picture of what you've seen so we get a better visual of it as well, and we'll follow up with you directly. Um, that's an optional thing. What they're really asking the community is just to get their voice out there, to be a part of this process, to feel like they're part of the community and engaged in this, this event. So again, I like it because it is very responsive in design. So let me show you that application here that we're running. So this is the browser-based version of that. And you'll notice, again, this is state of Rhode Island. This was a prototype that was worked. But if you want to submit a new report, I can simply come in here on the, the map itself, I can enter my address or I can go to the map itself and just tap a location. So when that location gets tapped in, it's going to go to it. I'm going to submit my report. 
And then I would come back and actually start to fill out this form. Now, because we're in a browser, we're getting a little different view of this, but radio buttons would, would show up as well. And then I can choose to attach a file and, and confirm my location next. So very simple, right? It doesn't have to be complex. The idea behind that is to be extremely simple, to engage the citizens in a really quick process, but to make them part of that conversation. So those two examples um, start to really show the idea of crowdsourcing and the value that GIS brings to that. Right? It's all about location. Um, but there are some, some interesting things that I want to come back to and, and talk about how we made that possible. Right? How does GIS enable you as, as the, the personnel again, responding to engage in that conversation to build the right application and have it in the hands of the digital volunteers to bring that voice forward? Right? And what we're talking about is kind of a transition. And so I wanted to take one step through um, a process to talk about how we got to those applications and then show you how to do it yourself. Right? So the idea that both of those apps are built on is all around the web. Right? And it's nothing new for us, but it, it is a, a new pattern that we have to consider. And that is, how do we take our services that we have internally in our own infrastructure and in our own GIS systems and make those available across the web into those applications that, that run on devices, that run on the browser? And to do that, we call it the web map. The web map is essentially the container, right? the container that starts to layer the right information, how we crowdsource the, the gas outage, right? How do we crowdsource where the, the debris is in the community? Those are just layers that we always have in our information, but now it's putting it into a web map, and that container is what allows us to use WebGIS then to enable a lot of applications, because once we've created that web map, that web map is accessible from any client, and that's the other key to crowdsourcing, right? People are going to bring their own device to the party. They're going to work on their desktops at home. They're going to be on the web um, on a tablet. They're going to be on their device for Android or, or iOS and their web phones. So they're going to be accessing the information from a lot of different places. So what we want to make sure is that, that that web map is accessible across any of those clients so that it, they can tell us where they are and what they're experiencing on the ground in their real time. So that web map that comes from your servers, right? Your data that you have locally, it's storing information on your databases behind the scenes and connected to the web map as a, as a service. Or it could be coming from online, right? Where you've got a hosted content and service that you're using in the cloud and layering into that web map and packaging up for delivery into those, those desktops, web and device on the, the top side from the client perspective. And that's really key because, you know, as GIS uh, practitioners, um, our job is to enable those knowledge workers, to enable those digital volunteers and those public um, citizens that we want to engage in this conversation to work wherever they need to work. Right? They're not going to be in our operations center. They're not going to be in our office. We want them to be able to be out in the field and extend our value, right? extend the force that we have out in the field to start collecting that relevant information. And that's what this idea of WebGIS is all about, to allow us as practitioners in GIS to understand what the process is to collect information make it available on the web maps, and then pushing out to enable and empower all those volunteers to, to play a role. So how do you do that? Right? How are the, the steps you can do? So I wanted to take a three-step process and show you a couple things to get started immediately, um, and then we can answer questions and move on into a longer term. So let's start there. So the first thing you can do, right? you're going to have to create a feature service. Right? The feature service is what's being edited. It's where the data is stored. It's where the data lives right? that you're going to be pushing out to the volunteers and asking them to crowdsource for you. And you can do that in a couple of ways. So number one, you can use your own data model. right? You have your web, you have your own GIS servers, you have your own infrastructure, and you want to publish that, that feature class that you have in your database as a feature service that can be then combined into that web map. Right, and we'll walk through that process. So at a very basic level, how do you get to that point of building a feature class? Think about a paper form. If you have a paper form that would be filled out during a process, whether that's a damage assessment or it's a citizen engagement survey, that paper form is essentially your data model that gets translated into a digital format. You can set domains on certain things so you get drop down so that people don't have to just freehand everything. You're actually curating a, a good data set that is listing out exactly what you want to hear from the community. Then the next thing you can do is actually you can take an existing feature service that somebody else has, one of your partners. So NAPSIG brings together a huge community of, of individuals around uh, the U.S. that are already doing a lot of this great work. So what if you could use their existing feature service as a template, as a model to get started without having to recreate the wheel and be up and running? And so I wanted to show you how to do that really quick because there's some neat tricks that are, that are available to help you be up and running a little quickly. So let me start here at the very front. 
So the first URL that I showed there at the, the top will take you to this page here. This is part of our disaster response program. It's an example of mobile applications that we've put out to help people do crowdsourcing and digital volunteer work. So that things like doing damage assessment for your own staff and those volunteers that help you with structural engineering. It's doing event planning. So there's a lot of things that you'll find in this list. But there's one that I want to walk through in particular that will help you. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that example from Huntington, New York. So you'll see right here in this, this application, this website here, we've got a down tree map. So this is actually a, a web map. I can click on that. Any of those icons that you see on there, you can click and explore. And this is just a, a live web map. So it's, you know, live and awake. It's got layers of information, pretty, pretty standard stuff in the GIS world. So we've got imagery behind the scenes. But what I'm seeing on the map in these, these red, green, and yellow are actually the status, right? So if it's unassigned, it's in progress or complete. You know, these points are what we want the citizens to tell us about. These are where the, the trees are down, where the power lines are down. So this is the data that gets formed as that feature service layered into a web map. So what do I mean by that? So let's take a, let, a step down. So this web map here, we can start to look at information. So you'll notice on the right-hand side, you can dig down into each of these examples, get directly into the web map itself, and ultimately back down to the back end where you see the bits and pieces that are layered together, all the pieces of information that are that are mashed up into that web map container. So down here in the bottom of this, this little metadata pad, this is what I'm getting. So these are the map contents. These are the layers of information that are being contained. And that first one I want to look at is a web service. So this is a hosted service, a template, an example, right? just like you could find from one of your neighboring jurisdictions or you have up and running. And I would like to take this without recreating it on my own. I want to just create a copy of this to use in my own services so it's my data, not somebody else's data. But I like the way they've already set it up. So I'm going to copy this. So this is what I want to do. I want to take this URL, and I'm going to come into my own environment. So I'm going to sign in here to, to my environment in the cloud. So give me a second to do that. So once I'm signed in, I can go to my content. And there's a, a neat trick that, that comes with part of this cloud environment. And you're going to see, number one, it's going to tell me that I can create a new service. So I'm going to come in here, and I can create this service if it'll catch up with me here. There we go. So I want to say I want to create a service. Now, this is pretty interesting because I can create a service from a couple of different directions. So one is that I can use an existing service that I have of my own. Right? I can come into my web server, my own data model, my own database, and grab that URL, create a service here, and then use that to, to layer into my web map that then gets distributed through those applications. Um, I can also then use a template. So if people have templates, we can create our own that we could just spin up every time a disaster occurs. We have a blank template that basically gets authored, created, and up and running. But what I want to do is I want to create an existing feature service. I'm going to create one from a URL. And I'm going to paste that URL to that down tree feature service that somebody else has created that I really like. Right? So that example that I gave you at the front side, that's what we're going to look at. So it's going to come in and tell me it sees that there's a down tree layer in here. So that's perfect. So I'm going to hit next. I'm going to come in and say I want to look at my area. So I'll come into where uh, we're located here in, in Redlands, California. I'm just going to zoom in. And so I can set the extent of this service to your own jurisdiction, your own geography. Hit next. And then just give it a quick title. So this will be uh, my Navisig uh, Down Trees. Right. And then I can tag it so I can find it. So this is how I start to discover this. So my you know, Navisig Demos, Trees debris, right? So give me a couple of keywords that I can search against and find this later. And then I can give a summary here. So it's already captured the summary of that other service that I'm going to copy and make my own. But essentially, I could put in here, customize this a little bit, and I'm going to save it to a, a folder. And I'll come into a NAPSIG folder here. And I'll put this live because I created one of them. You know, never know how the internet works. So I created another one just in case. <laughs> so what we're doing now is we're taking that existing web service. We're copying it, making it my own and creating a blank feature service that now I can use and engage with citizens to, to work within. So it's going to take a second to create this. There we go. So now here's our NAVSIG Down Trees Live Survey. It's a feature service. And I get a little bit of metadata and, and supporting information. So now once I've done to that, I can add it to my map. I can start to create that container, that web map that I'm going to use to share out into the, the environment. So you'll notice now I've got a, a layer in the map. It looks just like the other one we had. If I go to my editing mode now, 
I actually see that I have a template. So this now is live. I can start to work through a browser. And here's the blank template for me to put in my name, my phone number, the cause, right? And I can choose a, a, a picture to add directly from that. So that easily we were able to take somebody else's a template, get started, um, and be up and running. So that's the example that I wanted to give you. So first is create the feature service either from your own, use this URL here for DRP Mobile to discover some templates that we work with you as the community on for debris removal and the like. Just copy, create your own, and then create a web map. And to do that, we just kind of walk through the process. If you've never done that before, the URL here will talk you through how do you make a web map? How do you configure the pop-ups? How do you configure the symbology and the like so that it looks like you want it to look? And then finally, the last step that you want to take, just like we described, is publishing that application. So making that data available to the public. So there's two ways to do that. Um, there are a couple of templates that are available for you now. Um, one that I want to show you is called the Citizen Service Request. It's one that we've used uh, several times. It's a responsive design, meaning it's designed to work in the browser, on a phone, on a tablet. And it comes with a data model. So this one has data available in the package for you to download. And the application is really simple, right? I'm getting a web map, and all I have to do is tap the map, both from a browser or a phone, doesn't matter. But if I tap the map, I'm immediately going to get a, a service request detail. Now, behind the scenes on this, in the data model, there's a lot of information. So this is meant to be a citizen request that you would whittle down this massive list into the four or five things that you really are concerned about um, to help with. So for example, debris on the road or a down power line. So when the citizens get this application, when you tweet this out, when you put it on Facebook and you send it out through the news, they're going to use this URL. It's a web-based application on their phone. They're going to tap the map. They're going to tell you what they see, debris down. Then they're going to put a couple of things on it, suck it in, in a row. So tree down, for example, what my name is, my phone number, right, and an email address if I want you to follow up. And I can attach that photo. So this is already set up as a full template for you um, to completely run from. And what you're seeing is some constraints within that. So because this is a data model, it actually has some domains that require you to put in active information. So in this case, I, I tried to sneak around the, the phone requirements, tell me I've got to have 10 digits. So it's going to keep some of the data clean, and that's kind of a, a critical thing for us to do analysis against to make sure that the data in the database is clean. So this is an example. Right? This is an application that's up and running now. You can download, and you can actually follow the, the link here, CSR. will take you out directly to where that citizen service request template is, and where you can actually start to download it and walk through examples. So this is current for version 10, for version 10.1, and we'll launch 10.2 uh, this week to late uh, next week as well. So that's the last link, ezraero.com CSR. So the, the next step is, what if you wanted to use some, some native applications, right? The ones I just showed you as examples are all web-based. They require the browser access. But what if you wanted to use a native application for the smartphone of, of their choice, Android, or for iOS, or for Windows? So we have a blog to tell you how to do that. So the link here that you see on the screen is a step-by-step -step blog that talks about how to go find the, the applications. So in the app stores, there are free applications that you can start with, how you can create that web map, how do you actually put it into the, the application itself and how they can walk through all the way getting from a phone to a browser that you can start to get uh, another layer of situation awareness coming from those digital volunteers. All that information that they're putting in is being stored in the database either on your side of the house where it's touching your web services for your servers or it's in the cloud, right? Your choice, you determine what the best practice is for deploying that. So that step-by-step -step guide is a really good process to, to move through. Ryan, just a question. Um, sure. Trying to keep up with some of them. Uh, if you upload a photo, does the image get populated into the underlying feature class? Yes, it does. So it's a, it actually has an attachment in the feature class itself in the database, and that's both on your side and on your your SQL table or your Oracle or DB2 or in the cloud. Right. Either direction is a hosted service. That that attachment comes along with the actual feature itself. So when I click on a pop-up, if somebody had a photo, I'd actually see that photo as an attachment related to that point on the map. Okay, great. Sure uh, and uh, I'll connect you with uh, Gary Kennedy. He's been having some questions. Uh, they're going to start using GeoSuite and would like some help. Um, so maybe the, we can connect the two of you. Um, to get yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so that's it. So, so thank you, guys. I hope that gives you a sense of how you can do that, some good case studies and examples. Um, the idea of bringing 
forward from a feature service to a map that's an extended through applications. And there's a, a couple of templates that you can start from, and those links that will be provided afterwards will take you down that path as a starting point. But uh, So, Peter, back to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ryan. And it's terrific really getting, um, getting your hands dirty and showing us how to build that application. That's terrific. Um, uh, for those of you who are not paying attention to the Q&A section, I'd encourage you just to take a look at that um, that particular section. Uh, Christiana answered some questions that some folks had regarding um, the um, the um, sorry, my computer just tweaked on me. Um, some questions regarding her presentation and, and things such as retweets and Red Cross Red Cross University. Um, also, Christiana, I don't know if you looked at the chat section, but you've got uh, at least one uh, volunteer who signed up uh, because of your presentation. So a lot of excitement from what the Red Cross is doing. Uh, so that's great. That's terrific news. Yeah. It is great. <laughs> um, that's kind of what the point of all this really is. <laughs> Um, and then um, I guess that's it. I don't see any other questions pending. I'm having some trouble sharing my desktop, although there we go. Um, if, uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, we can answer them now. Otherwise, uh, we'll end the session. Um, yeah, we'll, the, the Q&A section, actually, I do have a question about the Q&A. The Q&A section um, window actually is available in the boxes that are downloaded um, when you download the recording. So if you download the recording from the NAPSIG website, uh, you'll actually get all the Q&A. Um, that data, that information is saved. Uh, any further questions uh, from or comments from Ryan, Christiana, or David? Okay, hearing none. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, from uh, from the panelists, uh, Ryan, Christian, and David, for taking the time and putting together this this really great session. Um, it's uh, it, you know social media has been a real bugaboo for the public safety world, and you guys are really doing a great job by leadership and by um, taking the time to talk to us to uh, demystify it a little bit. Um, and most importantly, I want to thank all the participants for taking the time and listening to this. Uh, we, we base our virtual training sessions on input from you all, uh, so this is uh, something that you've asked for, and hopefully this is just another step in um, addressing some of the issues that you have. Look forward to a third session on social media in our series, uh, which should be coming around the September-October time frame. Uh, that being said, thank you to everyone again, and uh, it is available on the NAPSIG website, uh, www.napsigfoundation.org. Just look for the uh, latest news section, and that should be posted tonight. Um, the recording is now ending, uh, so thank you. Uh, this concludes the training session.